Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, March 2nd, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, how the IRS is providing refunds to people who never filed taxes. Then, deadly bacteria escaped from a Louisiana bio lab and the brazen murder of a top Putin critic. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. We'll inoculate these pesky Earth creatures. There, now you're not too smart, are you? Now my takeover plan will be successful. Well, the Western media was full of conspiracy theories this last weekend. Mainstream media had nothing but certainty that Vladimir Putin was behind the assassination of Boris Nemtsov. This is an article from New American, Putin critic Nemtsov murdered. Now, what most people will read in that is that Putin murdered his critic. And that's the way it's been portrayed in the mainstream media. Now, the New American reports that they believe 100,000 people marched the day following that. There was also a demonstration that had been scheduled prior to the assassination of Boris. Many sources will say that it was tens of thousands. We don't know the exact number, but it looks like it was between 30,000 and 100,000. This is someone who is a dissident to Putin, but pretty much forgotten over the period of history. Someone who was highly placed in the Yeltsin regime, but he was not chosen to succeed Yeltsin. Instead, Yeltsin was succeeded by Vladimir Putin. Now, the New American believes that it was Vladimir Putin. They say that within minutes, Putin claimed that the murder was likely arranged by Nipsov's supporters as a false flag to damage his reputation, to spark public dissension among Putin's policies in Ukraine and Russia's rapidly deteriorating economy. However, Mikhail Gorbachev and also people in America like Paul Craig Roberts see it very differently. In an interview with King World, Paul Craig Roberts and others in the West believe that the CIA may have assassinated Boris Nipsov. He says, Boris Nipsov, a Russian dissident politician, highly critical of Vladimir Putin, often sounded like an agent of Washington. If Nipsov wasn't assassinated by the CIA in order to blame Putin, most likely he said Nipsov was killed by Russian nationalists who saw him as Washington's agent. Because I can tell you one thing, that is that Putin is much too smart to play into Washington's hands this way. Moreover, Nipsov, although a loudmouth, had no impact on Putin's 85% approval rating. There were suspicions, but they were dismissed simply as conspiracy theories. So lone killers really only operate in the West. If it's something that happens elsewhere, people acknowledge that there was more than one person involved. So everybody's a conspiracy theorist. Vladimir Putin says it was a CIA conspiracy. And of course, all of the Western media is united in saying that it was a Putin conspiracy. We know they both kill people. We know they're both rival gangs, just like the Tataglias or the Corleones or Don Moroni or Don Falcone, if you want to look at fiction. The CIA and the KGB, Vladimir Putin or Obama, it really doesn't matter. They're all mafia hitmen. They've all killed a large number of people. As the New American points out, the number of people that we know that Vladimir Putin has killed. We know that Obama has assassinated thousands with drones many of them innocent people. So would he kill a political enemy? Would the people who support him kill somebody who was once their ally in order to further their cause against Vladimir Putin? It's a very dangerous game. But I think we need to take a look back, step back at this and look at it and say, can we believe that corruption like this happens in America or is it something that only happens in other countries? I think it's very interesting that on Friday, we had a Missouri candidate for governor die again of an apparent suicide. This is a guy who was the auditor in the state of Missouri. He was going to be running for governor. He apparently committed suicide just 13 minutes after inviting reporters to his home for an interview. That doesn't really matter that the subject of the interview was he was dishing on some other people in the GOP saying that they were coming after him as anti-Semitic remarks because he was Jewish. Maybe he was killed, maybe he wasn't. We've certainly seen a lot of suicides of people who the power structure wanted to get to. Gary Webb, for example, in Dark Alliance, where he was reporting about the drug trade between Central America under the Reagan administration, Oliver North, where they were fueling the crack cocaine epidemic. We had the DC madam also, both of them came on and talked to Alex and said, no, we're fighting this, we're not turning back, 
were not suicidal. Alex even asked them on his show, are you suicidal? No, I'm not suicidal. We know that Aaron Schwartz was not suicidal. He was a fighter. He was fighting CISPA, and he was winning. And they brought trumped-up charges against him. He refused a plea bargain. He was engaged. He was engaged to be married, and he was engaged in the fight. And then he turns up suicided. And, of course, then there's Michael Hastings. Michael Hastings' accident looked suspicious from the get-go, with the engine being ejected down the road after his car collided head-on into a tree, the way it burned, the way it exploded. And then we learned after that that he was concerned that someone was going to rig his car. Someone was going to put a bomb on his car. We learned that he had texted his colleagues, that he, had, he was investigating something that was very sensitive. He had to disappear. He was afraid for his life. But we can't believe in America that something like we just saw happen in Russia can happen here. It always has to be one crazy individual. We can't believe that there are people in our government that are criminal murderers and assassins. We can only believe that about Russia. Now, in other news, we see that uh, CPAC this last week has had a lot of amazing announcements. We had Michael Hayden, former director of the NSA, the CIA, describing himself as an unrelenting libertarian. Yeah, right. We also saw Jeb Bush refuse to even walk back any of his amnesty policies on illegal immigration, saying that we still needed to go ahead and extend educational benefits to them that even American citizens don't get. Talking about voting rights, driver's licenses, nothing. Would He would not walk back any of that. But one of the most amazing things that came out of it, of course, was a reaction to Scott Walker's comments comparing protesters against his uh, Many would characterize it as anti-union tactics. Uh, the, the unions are very upset about what he's done as governor. He characterizes it, and I would believe it was right to work laws that he was putting through. But nevertheless, he compared the 100,000 protesters that he had to deal with, saying that if he could deal with them, he could deal with ISIS. Many people said, you're essentially equating people who are political dissidents in this country with ISIS. That's maybe a bit of a stretch, but what is not a stretch is a panel that was held at CPAC. This panel says, when should America go to war? Very good question. Here's what the GOP says about it, according to Reason. They say they advocated preemptive war against Iran. They wanted a significant jacking up of the U.S. military budget. They wanted sharply increased readiness to go to war in order to prevent having to go to war. Yes, the real scandal was not what Scott Walker said, but the willingness of the GOP to go to war. Here's some of the quotes. U.S. policy today, yesterday, and tomorrow should be the overthrow of the Ayatollahs. That's Bolton talking. Another one says we left Iraq too soon. Another one says, yes, we did leave too soon, and we have to re-engage. And another one, second side, says we have a duty to fight ISIS. We have to use preemptive use of military force, and it's necessary. No war that they can imagine is one that they don't want to get involved in. And that's the real scandal that comes out of the neocons, even at a conference that is noted for being one of the most libertarian in the GOP. Now, we also see that our government has essentially declared war here in America. I should say our dictator, Obama, is at war with the Constitution. You didn't hear too much about that at CPAC, certainly not in that conference. And as Paul Joseph Watson points out, there's a run on AR-15 ammo, a buying frenzy, as some fear a total gun ban. Not banning the guns, but taking away the ammunition, turning the guns into empty clubs, essentially. And people understand where this is going. The people who own firearms know exactly where this is going. Listen to what one hunter said when they talked to him in the store. They said, once they get this particular bullet off the market, they'll go for the next, and then the next. And then another man in Oklahoma told Channel 9 News, he says, I think it's them just trying to do little bits and pieces to get their ultimate goal to ban tactical style rifles. Doing little bits and pieces, going after one thing, then going after the next and after the next and after the next, that's called infringement. The founders knew that would be the way that the Second Amendment would be destroyed. They knew that would be the way that the government would come after our God-given rights, little by little. In the First Amendment, they say Congress shall make no law. They knew that they could outlaw free speech with one fell swoop. 
But when it comes to guns, they're going to have to take it little by little, and we have to fight them every inch of the way and not allow them to do that. Now, we also see that the IRS, and another story, is defending payments to illegals who are never who had never filed taxes. The IRS is defending its decision to let illegal immigrants claim up to three years refunds on income, even if they never paid income taxes. And they're telling Congress in a new letter last week that the IRS agency lawyers have concluded that getting a Social Security number triggers the ability to go back and ask for previous refunds. They say it is not required to have a Social Security number before the close of the year for which the earned income tax credit is claimed. Last week when I talked to the people with welcoming cities and counties, essentially welcoming immigrants, and of course, as a lady pointed out, she made no distinction between legal and illegal immigrants. She was quick to point out that they have career paths that they're working for immigrants. She said 25% of the people here in Austin are high-tech workers. The way that's playing out in California is we have foreign workers who are processing unemployment checks for Californians. That's what it's come to. We have a department with $200 million budget, the Employment Development Department, and with the exception of two managers, everyone inside the office is from outside the U.S., mostly Indian nationals. Now, this is a visa program that's been used by tech companies like Microsoft, Intel, Google, and Facebook. They report on one man here who lost his job, who worked for Hewlett Packard. He was laid off from the Roseville plant during the height of the H-1B program when as many as 300,000 workers were allowed to take jobs in the U.S., not jobs flipping burgers, not jobs working in fields that they tell us that nobody in America wants to do, so they're bringing in people from outside the country. These are jobs that people do want. This man got laid off just before Christmas in 1996, two weeks, in fact. He says he's afraid more Americans will be replaced by foreign-born workers. He said, I'm single income in my family. So on that particular day, as a direct result of this program, we were unable to provide Christmas presents, and I kept telling my kids that Santa might not show up. So the question is, are the lower wages that you're going to be getting because they're bringing in so many foreign workers and the higher taxes that you're going to be paying for schools and other benefits, other entitlements that they're extending, is that going to make it impossible for you to keep your home, for example? Not just lose your job, not just have lower income. Are you going to lose your home trying to keep this entitlement state that is exploding afloat? Well, there was a global warming meeting at the state capitol in Texas, and Jakari Jackson has a report. Is it a national security threat, as they were telling us, or is it the threat of new taxes? Stay with us. We'll be right back. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com. Oil of oregano formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent form of oregano oil on the market sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules you will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue wild crafted from the mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire this winter season it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano. Now available in our limited first run at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com or call 888-253-3139.
The issue of man-made climate change came to the Texas Capitol. Two high-ranking spokesmen for the Center of Naval Analysis spoke of climate change as a national security threat. Rear Admiral Neil Morsetti. If we act in a coherent and coordinated fashion, not only will we reduce the risk posed to national security and the calls upon our respective armed forces, but we'll enjoy the economic benefits and the better quality of life that comes with that. And I'd just like to conclude by saying there is no security solution to climate change, just greater insecurity if we don't act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sounds reasonable, right? I don't have a problem as long as he doesn't call for a carbon tax. Within Europe as a whole, money is coming from the emissions trading scheme, uh, where there's a price on carbon. And is that a tax, just a straight up tax, or is it uh, so all a in credit? It's all in terms of purposes, it's a tax. Uh -huh. yeah. And there's the carbon tax. The carbon tax being something to encourage citizens to reduce their carbon emissions. Meanwhile, military conflicts leave huge carbon footprints, not to mention weapons for our enemies to use against us, but that's another story. But the debate is settled. Climate change is a fact. And when our children's children look us in the eye and ask if we did all we could to leave them a safer, more stable world with new sources of energy, I want us to be able to say, yes, we did. You've probably heard that before, that all credible scientists follow the narrative of man-made climate change. But as the founder of the Weather Channel points out, science isn't a consensus. When you see the government, when you see NASA, when you see other institutions say that 97% of climate scientists agree, do you think they're making it up? I, I, what I don't understand is how you well, square that. Well, that's a manipulated that. figure, and let me explain it to you. Uh, this, the uh, government puts out about $2.5 billion directly for climate research every year. It only gives that money to scientists who will produce scientific results that support the global warming hypothesis. And in that full debate, the CNN anchor pitted Mr. Coleman against the CEO of the Weather Channel, who is a businessman, not a scientist. But let's address some of the concerns by those who warn of climate change. Greenland would also raise sea level almost 20 feet if it went. If Greenland broke up and melted, or if half of Greenland and half of West Antarctica broke up and melted, this is what would happen to the sea level in Florida. This is what would happen to San Francisco Bay. A lot of people live in... Last I checked, that hasn't happened. Scientists reported with unprecedented alarm that the North Polar ice cap is, in their words, falling off a cliff. One study estimated that it could be completely gone during summer in less than 22 years. Another new study to be presented by U.S. Navy researchers later this week warns it could happen in as little as seven years. Seven years from now. It's been more than seven years since Gore stated that study, and that hasn't happened either. But I do appreciate him being bold enough to reference studies because now climate change, quote, experts refuse to make any concrete predictions or forecast. So when it's cold, should we then say, oh, no problem, don't worry about climate change? No, no, let's not confuse or interchange climate change with uh, global warming. Global, the world is getting warmer. There's more carbon dioxide holding in more heat. So when the climate changes, some places get colder. And the thing that's really consistent with climate change models is this variance, where it's cold, it's warm, it's cold, it's warm. I'll play that again so you can hear how he's coaching the anchor to be vague. Global, the world is getting warmer. There's more carbon dioxide holding in more heat. So when the climate changes, some places get colder. And the thing that's really consistent with climate change models is this variance, where it's cold, it's warm, it's cold, it's warm. Don't say global warming because if it's cold, people won't take you seriously. Don't say global cooling because if it's hot outside, people are going to laugh at you. Use the all-inclusive term of climate change, so that way if it's hot, you'll be right. If it's cold outside, you'll be right. If it rains outside, you'll be right. If it's drought, you'll also be right. You may have heard that 2014 was the warmest year on record. I think they should add an addendum to that title, 2014, the warmest year on record with the exception of Chicago, Illinois, which was the coldest in 100 years. 2014, the warmest year on record, with the exception of the Great Lakes that froze onto the land masses. But remember, call it climate change, so regardless of whether it's hot or cold, 
you'll be right. It's cold, it's warm, it's cold, it's warm. Now, let's talk about melting ice. Visual proof of Mendenhall's steady retreat. Now in the winter, will this come back? The retreat will tend to slow down in the winter time. Okay. It may be it even stabilizes or creeps forward a tiny little bit. But boy, as soon as the warming season comes back on, it continues to gobble itself backwards. I definitely do recognize that that ice melted, but I also remember this. Another new study to be presented by U.S. Navy researchers later this week warns it could happen in as little as seven years. So is it possible that that ice melted and then refroze someplace else? Just like we saw the ice of the Great Lakes, it froze onto the landmass and then melted back into the Great Lakes, and I'm sure it will do it again. Later on in that same report, they blamed Hurricane Sandy damage on climate change. And as I'm sure any 12-year-old science student can tell you, there have always been floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, long before coal power plants, big oil, and SUVs. And to be clear, I'm not here cheerleading for big oil. I definitely recognize the BP spill and all the problems that that caused. With that said, I make no money from big oil, but I also don't want to give my money to big carbon tax. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. We're here at a supermarket in Toledo. You can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must have for every modern, independently minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. Introducing Secret 12, the new InfoWars Life Vitamin B12 formulation. Most forms of vitamin B12 are highly processed and synthetic and could not be properly absorbed by the body. That's why for real results, so many are having to turn to painful B12 injections, which are known to have higher absorption rates. Now, InfoWarsLife.com is excited to announce that we can bring you our most bioactive, powerful form of B12 that has been developed with our exclusive perfected process. Secret 12 is a binary of Nutramedical grade, bioavailable coenzyme forms of B12, methylcobalamin, the same kind used in B12 injections, and adenosyl cobalamin. Secret 12 is simply taken by mouth, right on the tongue, and then swallowed. No needles, no injections. Don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. Discover the secret. Secret 12. Secure your revolutionary Secret 12 formula right now at InfoWarsLife.com or call 888-253-3139. Well, for the last several days, our reporters have been in Chicago investigating the reports from The Guardian of a black interrogation site there. People being held for days without being formally charged or arraigned, people being tortured, and in some cases, people dying. We've had reports of eyewitnesses as well as lawyers. And so our reporters went there to cover the protests against this, as well as to see if there were other black sites. Well, joining us now is Joe Biggs in Chicago. Joe. You tried to find some of these other sites that have been reported to you. What did you find out? Uh, so far, we've been unlucky trying to find any of these other sites. We've been chasing leads, going to different uh, locations. So far, these sites are a bust. It's looking like the one at Homan Square is possibly the main one, if there are any other ones in this area. But the big question is, if they're in Homan Square, they're in Chicago, there's probably a good chance they're operating in those uh, same kind of facilities in Detroit, L.A., other places like that, but really large cities with a lot of crime. Yeah, and I think it, uh, it's very interesting to see how this was tracked down by The Guardian, essentially looking 
at a Chicago police detective who was involved in Guantanamo, tracing it back to there. And then this has all got its roots really in the war on drugs. It seems to be where we see so many of these abuses. But now we see that Obama and Rahm Emanuel have taken this, I think, perhaps to the national level. That's what we're all very concerned about. Not that this is just some kind of an aberration of the war on drugs in Chicago, but that it is something that would be extended across the country. Yeah, there's a good chance that this could be a testing ground, a proving ground for many other facilities that open up across the country. I mean, at the end of the day, this is the direction it looks like we're going to in America. More of these detention, off the book, off the record kind of sites where people are disappeared, held without their rights, not able to call lawyers, not essentially just a blackout with communications with the outside world. I mean, that's got to be a horrible, horrible feeling being held in one of these places, shackled and beaten, and not having any contact with the outside world, not being able to speak to your lawyer and knowing if you're ever going to get out of there alive. And that's exactly what the NDAA was all about. Everybody was concerned that you could be arrested, uh, never charged with anything, held indefinitely, even rendered out of the country to be, uh, to be interrogated, to be tortured. But of course, seeing that here in Chicago, whether or not it is uh, something that is, has come out of that, or whether it's just a, a, a product of the war on drugs, which really the war on terror has really grown out of that as well. A lot of the same tactics, uh, creating a situation, using that to destroy the rule of law, using that to corrupt the police department and law enforcement, uh, that's what we're really concerned about. When you talk to people on the streets, and you had some uh, men on the street interviews today, does there seem to be any more awareness of it after this weekend? Quite frankly, it's pretty sad, David. There's not many people who have any clue of, as to what Home and Square is, yet alone the horrific things that are happening behind those closed doors. Maybe a small handful of people actually even knew what it was, but they still didn't have the full details about the whistleblowers who've come out talking about, you know, the defense attorney, Anthony Hill, saying that this place is off the record, off the books. People are being disappeared. They're being tortured. They're being shackled. They're being treated like terrorists of Guantanamo Bay. Some people, I mean, for the most part, had no idea that this was in their backyard. And when I talked to them today, it was the first they'd ever heard about it. That's where the big problem is. There's this huge blackout in the mainstream media. They're not talking about it whatsoever. I mean, I would want to know if I was a Chicagoan, that there was a torture facility in my city. And the news, they're not doing their job covering it. They brush it off, they laugh it off. Even though the police don't care, they're joking about it and they think it's a funny situation. I don't think it's funny. Absolutely, you know, for the last 20 years, I've been involved with various groups trying to bring attention to what was going on in the war on drugs, for instance, with civil asset forfeiture, with the abuses of SWAT teams, and the mainstream media was not reporting it. For the longest time, it's only been within the last year or so that we see a general awareness of the abuses of SWAT teams, the abuses of civil asset forfeiture, where they can go in and just confiscate your property without ever charging you with a crime. For many decades, we're talking to people about this and they would say, well, that's just one particular case or that's just that one corrupt police department. They didn't understand how pervasive it was. Finally, we see that happening, but it's not because of the mainstream media. For 20 years, the mainstream media didn't cover this. So if people become aware of this, if they understand that this is really setting a precedent, perhaps this is something, as we've had many reports of, it's been going on for many, many years, long before Obama went to Washington. Is this something that Obama brought to Washington, put into the NDAA? It's something we all need to be concerned about, not just people in Chicago. Yes, exactly. And one of the interesting things, too, there was one guy who had heard about the situation at Home and Square, but he still didn't believe it whatsoever. He says, yeah, I heard about it. He's like, but the Chicago PD is a very corrupt uh, police force. And he says he thinks that a lot of people just have it out for him. And that's what this whole story is coming from, is that it was a lot of people who have uh, harsh feelings about the Chicago PD and the tactics they use. Therefore, the story was created to uh, kind of get back, he said, at the Chicago Police Department. That's the problem, is the compartmentalization of people. They think that, well, this is just uh, the police attacking black people, or this is just one police department in Chicago. They don't see the big picture. The bottom line is, even if that were true, even if this was limited to Chicago and limited in Chicago to just home and square, it is part of the lawlessness that's come along with drug prohibition. And I think people don't really understand that until they address the root cause, prohibition, we're going to continue to see things like Home and Square, like civil asset forfeiture, confiscation, the cops turning into thieves on the street, 
and we're going to see SWAT teams that are breaking into people's homes with no-knock raids, injuring many innocent people, and way over the top even for the guilty people. That's the thing that I'm concerned about. Well, that's why they want to bring tank ambulance into the uh, equation. They want to have this huge MRAP tank-looking thing with a red cross on the side so you, the victim, at home, minding your own business, can feel better knowing that after they drive down your wall and they come in with this no-knock raid and storm in and, you know, essentially start throwing flash grenades into your family, into their rooms, they have this huge MRAP there that's going to protect you after they've come in and destroyed your entire life. Well, you've got to come back tomorrow, but uh, there's a couple of lawyers that you're going to talk to, and those didn't pan out. Is that correct? Um, well, tonight at 6, there's supposed to be a protest right outside of Rahm Emanuel's uh, facilities where he operates out of. We're going to go out there and try to talk to some people. Maybe if the lawyer that we were supposed to talk to today, uh, he uh, gave me another number to another lady who works in the same department as him. She uh, had a client who was actually held at Homan Square and was beaten and punched. If she gets in, uh, she's delayed in Denver for snow. If she can get in tomorrow, if we have a chance to talk to her before we leave out of here, we'll try to do that. But other than that, one of the weird, uh, one of the things we talked about today as well is we asked people, do you actually think Rahm Emanuel had knowledge of this black site, you know, this operational black site on American soil? And if so, do you think it'll have any kind of effect in this mayoral uh, election that's coming up, the, uh, the face-off in April? And most people said, I think it should have an effect on the outcome of the election, but they said, I don't think it will because uh, Rahm Emanuel has been there so long and he's so embedded in the city that he, they don't think there's really a chance that he'll, he'll lose and he'll still be there. Yeah, he probably knows where the keys to the voting machines are as well. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, I, I guess that brings up a question. That if he didn't know about this, what does that say about his competency? and about the corruption within the police department that's underneath him. I mean, where does the buck stop? We had, uh, once we had a president who said the buck stops here, took responsibility for those who are underneath him. But now everybody wants to say, well, I, I didn't know anything about that. I, you know, I have plausible deniability. So it directly reflects either on his incompetence or on him being essentially uh, a, a crook who uh, allows this to happen. Yeah, one of the uh, the, the common uh, reactions we got from people, as soon as I mentioned Chicago PD, they would go, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk about this. I, I'm good. <laughs> so that, most people just don't want to talk about it. They'd rather sweep it under the rug. Meanwhile, we have American citizens at Omen Square and God knows how many other facilities like it being tortured right now at this very instant here in America. Well, it sounds like people in Chicago are afraid of the police. If the stories that are coming out of Homan Square are true, and I I believe those lawyers, I believe the people who came forward about that, if that's true, they have reason to be afraid. You know, when, it, yeah. when people are afraid of their government, that's tyranny. And so that's essentially what we see going on there. Well, we'll uh, stay tuned for your reports, uh, see what happens with this uh, uh, thing tonight at Rahm Emanuel. I guess it's a demonstration. Is that what it is? Uh, yes, sir. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Joe Biggs. And we'll look forward to seeing you back here in warmer Austin. Yes. Can't <laughs> okay. wait. All right. Take care. So the question is, is it just one site? Is it just one city? Perhaps it is. But we see increasingly law enforcement being under centralized control out of Washington. We see that they are setting the training, the agenda, the methods, the tactics, the equipment that they're given. All of it coming out of Washington. And of course, Obama himself is from Chicago. That should make us all concerned that it is not limited to this one area. We'll continue to investigate. At this point, it looks like we've got more questions than answers. Well, that's it for tonight. If you're not a Prison Planet TV subscriber, please consider becoming one and supporting our operation financially. It'll allow you to share the news as it happens each Monday through Friday with up to 20 of your friends, as well as have access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Well, that's it for tonight. Join us tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And
and most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that 6 million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.